recorded as of right now. Um, <clears throat> and the court recording will be sent out after the webinar as well. Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Um, my name is Sheila Rabin and I'm the ORCID US Community Specialist at Lyricis. So I provide dedicated support for over 120 research institutions in the US that are ORCID members through our national ORCID consortium known as the ORCID US Community. If you have any questions as we proceed today, please type them into the chat box and we will have time at the end of the session for Q&A and discussion. Um, and I am very excited because today we have a special guest and I am so pleased to introduce Richard Wynn, uh, founder and CEO of Rescognito, which is a new ORCID-based tool that provides an open environment where researchers and research professionals can be recognized for a wide range of behaviors and contributions that benefit the open research ecosystem. Um, prior to launching Rescognito in June of this year, Richard served as the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Aries Systems. So with no further ado, I will hand it over to Richard and we will hear about Rescognito. Hello everyone. I uh, am just going to complete sharing my screen and I hope that you can see my PowerPoint. And thank you, Sheila. It's an honor and a pleasure to participate in this webinar. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to everyone who made the, who's making the time to attend. As you heard, I spent the past 20 years working in the development of peer review workflow systems for scholarly journals. Before that, I was at Silver Platter, a bibliographic search engine company that some of you, as, as long as you're my kind of age, uh, may well remember. <clears throat> During these assignments, I noticed many pain points in scholarly workflow, and it, is be and it became increasingly apparent that uh, persistent identifiers or PIDs, especially ORCID, could help solve many of these problems. So when Relix or Elsevier purchased Aries Systems, it was a great opportunity for me to transition to this new venture at Rescognito where we are exploring new ways to recognize research contributions by leveraging persistent identifiers. The agenda this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are, uh, we will start with a brief introduction and then there'll be some audience participation uh, for which you will need your ORCID uh, login so that you can validate your ID. Um, after that, I will discuss how ORCID DOR I, ROR, and credit uh, are combined to create two types of recognition, peer-to-peer uh, -peer recognition and curated or institutional recognition. Uh, then I'll move on to a more extended demo and then talk about some practical use cases for libraries because we're looking for uh, early adopters, um, people who are interested in using some of the attributes of what we're doing. And of course, I'll stay on as long as you like uh, to answer questions. So each year approximately $2 trillion is spent on research. Um, and that goes into a factory, if you like, that contains academic institutions and about 10 million researchers. The outputs of those research investments are evaluated principally by using published manuscripts and citations. And based on those evaluations, the next $2 trillion is invested. As was recently noted by Janetta Jones of the Wellcome Foundation, we know fairly little about this process and there's plenty of room for improvement. And some of that room for improvement comes from the limitations which exist related to publication and citation. So principally, there are mechanical problems of identification and attribution. There are counterproductive incentives, and there are overlooked contributions. And I'm gonna discuss each of these uh, in a bit more detail. So the mechanical problems, of course, with, uh, you're all very familiar with what a citation looks like. Often the uh, contributors are only identified by text strings leading to ambiguity. Unfortunately, ORCID is starting to clean up that problem. 
but the contributions of each individual are implied by format rather than being explicit. So in some disciplines, the first author is most important. In other disciplines, it's the last. And in other cultures and disciplines, authors or contributors are presented alphabetically. There's a lot of imprecision in that when a citation uh, is uh, made from a manuscript that has 10 contributors to a manuscript that has another 10 contributors, that indicates 100 possible connections between those contributors. Um, there is no citation reason or waiting. Uh, there's no contribution labeling, so we don't know specifically uh, what each of these contributors did on the manuscript. And sometimes, if there is, it's typically, as seen on the left here, an acknowledgement statement involving initials which link to full text uh, strings, which again are very ambiguous. Um, there's inconsistent display and structure of these acknowledgements. There are idiosyncratic uh, taxonomies for recognition. Um, and this means that the acknowledgements are not interoperable and not reportable, uh, particularly from a library point of view, where you would like to know what your researchers are contributing uh, to the body of research. The counterproductive incentives that exist from the publish or perish culture are well known. And they exist because research productivity is equated with the generation of publications and citations. In fact, citations are said to be worth about $100,000 in uh, research funding. So it's not surprising that rational researchers optimize their citations, but this has led to low morale with people saying that they're doing research to get grants rather than the other way around, getting grants to do research. It also leads to a number of counterproductive behaviors such as salami slicing, key hacking, uh, and, and overselling of correlation effects. Journals as well participate uh, in this uh, a gaming of the system uh, by publishing review articles that receive a high number of citations, thereby increasing their measure of impact. Um, and as can be seen from this example tweet, editors sometimes pressure authors to cite the journal itself, presumably in an attempt to increase the impact factor uh, of the journal. The result is that even as uh, the public is becoming aware of a crisis of reproducibility in research, uh, so much so that there was an article in The Economist a few years ago where the scientific process becomes undermined in the public eye and funding becomes vulnerable. If we look at how research is funded, you can think of it as a factory. And in the 1970s, American car manufacturers fell behind <laughs> international publishers, uh, uh, international car manufacturers, because they only did quality assurance testing at the end of the process. Whereas Japanese companies used the process of total quality assurance, where they were measuring quality throughout the process. And this conforms with the, the observation by Alison Muddit from PLOS, saying that research is not article shaped. In other words, we need to be able to tap in to multiple points in the workflow to assess quality further upstream to ensure a better final product. And the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment really uh, encapsulates that by saying we need to uh, reorganize the way uh, research is recognized. And I can't really say it better than Stephen Curry, who said that researchers deserve to be judged on the basis of what they have done, not simply where they have been published. So, article citations indicate a possible connection between any number of ambiguously identified authors to an unspecified number of ambiguously identified authors in the cited manuscript for an unspecified reason, in recognition of unspecified contributions, for motivations that are not transparent, while totally excluding non-manuscript related contributions. On this basis, we produce measures of impact uh, that are supposed to be accurate to three decimal places and make judgments about the careers of, ten, of millions of researchers and invest trillions of dollars of society's resources. Well, it's all very well to criticize, 
but let's try and think about and propose something better that leverages persistent identifiers to create a better recognition system. So what would that look like? Well, the signal produced by the system would be better. It would be open and free to individual researchers. It would be transparent, meaning that recognition is direct and not mediated through brands or opaque measures of impact. It would be democratic where anyone can participate. It would be granular with factual contributions being recognized. It would be attributable through assertions that are verifiable. And because it's standards-based, it would be interoperable and reportable. So what is ResCognito? ResCognito is a platform for recognition. Uh, we are not a hosting website like a Highwire or an Atapon. Uh, we are not a profile site. Uh, we are not a workflow system. We focus entirely on recognition. And our system is built around two types of recognition, peer-to-peer -peer recognition, where one individual recognizes another, and more importantly, institutional recognition, where a credentialed organization, be it a, a funder or a research organization uh, or a library, recognizes an individual for their contribution. And I'm going to be showing you both of these, but just in case you are about to fall asleep, uh, now is the time for some audience uh, participation. So I'm going to ask you to switch to your browser and go to the uh, ResCognito website. So it's www.rescognito.com. Uh, this is a live website that's running uh, today and you can go to it right now. I'll give you a second to navigate there. When you get to rescognito.com, you'll see that uh, there's a search box and I'd like you to type my name, Richard Wynn. So that is Richard, W-Y-N-N-E. And click on the search icon. You'll see a list of candidate matches. Uh, I'm the second in the list. You'll see that I was formerly at Aries Systems. I'm at ResCognito. Uh, and I received an education at Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh. On the right-hand side, next to my name, you'll see a button that says View Ledger. And I'm going to ask you to click on that. And what you're looking at now is my open ledger where recognition for me has been recorded. And I'm going to explain this in more detail later on, um, but you'll see that it includes a recognition counter called a COG. A COG is short for recognize. And you'll see that I've received uh, 230 of them. There are actually two ways to recognize me. One is uh, on the bottom right-hand side where I can be recognized with respects to a specific DOI. And next to my name at the top is where I can uh, be recognized for general activity. And I'm going to ask you to click on this button here, the, re the recognize button that appears next to my name. When you click on that button, you're going to be prompted to enter your ORCID identification uh, uh, so that as you recognize me, your ORCID ID will be known. So our system does not require any kind of registration. It doesn't require membership. But when you recognize someone else, uh, we are uh, requiring that you validate your ORCID ID. So please go ahead and enter your ORCID email address, uh, your ORCID ID or your email address, then your password on ORCID and sign in. Now, in your case, you'll be prompted to authorize ResCognito to view your uh, ORCID ID. And if you could uh, just go ahead and say yes to that, um, then you will be coming to this screen uh, where you can select the reason that you're going to recognize me. This is general recognition. I'll get to DOI-based recognition in a second, but I wanted to get for you to have a feel of the system. So from the drop-down list here, you can see I can be recognized for a variety of things, such as clinical trials management, community engagement, contributions to diversity uh, and uh, inclusion. But what I'd like you to do is scroll down and select public outreach and education. So that's what I'm actually doing today is public outreach and education. 
And once you've selected that in the drop down, click Recognize Now. And what this will do is that it will update my ledger to show that you've recognized me. And uh, I'm delighted to see that several of you have been working along line here uh, and actually uh, recognize me. And you'll see that uh, the, the buttons on the right allow this information to be tweeted out. So th thank you all for that audience participation. And uh, we'll go on to discuss the system in, in, more, in more detail right now. So as I said, the Rescognito Open Ledger is a structured, attributable, and granular way to record recognition. You'll see that I've highlighted the Rescognito uh, URL here on the top left because you can get to anyone's ledger by adding their ORCID ID to the Rescognito URL. So this is a great example of how we're leveraging uh, PIDs to get people directly into the system where they can uh, uh, do uh, transactions. The idea is to provide a recognition incentive that's easy and convenient. Uh, since many of you were able to recognize me, I guess uh, hopefully you found it easy and convenient. You can re recognize a full range of activities and um, that it's granular and accountable through that uh, ORCID sign-in process. Um, we are building on what's there already. So we're not looking to um, uh, totally disrupt the way recognition is done today, but we want to leverage and improve what journals and libraries uh, and other organizations are doing today with this open ledger. So what can be recognized? Well, from this screenshot you can see here, this author, uh, PLOS author, uh, has been recognized for uh, various credit contributions to this particular uh, manuscript. And I'll be showing you this live in a moment for another author. Professional societies, libraries, academic institutions can recognize a wide range of behaviors, such as conference presentations, participating in continuing educations, prizes, and awards. Uh, there's ad hoc recognition, which we just did. Uh, we can recognize individuals for peer review, so we are looking at working with journals so that they can uh, recognize the peer review contributions. Here is an example, again, from PLOS. Um, and many organizations want to encourage open science by recognizing things such as open materials, uh, open data, uh, or publishing negative uh, results. So we can put those open science badges into ResCognito and make an award uh, for them. All of this information is contained in a single ledger that can be accessed via an API. And so the information can be presented for different use cases. So in this example, we can visualize the recognition that this person has received both from other individuals and from institutions. So just to recap, peer-to-peer -peer recognition is one person recognizing another validated through the ORCID ID. And then institutional recognition is where the recognizing body is not another person, but an organization that's identified by its ROR, or Research Organization Registry ID. And so in this mock-up here, you can see that uh, Christie has been recognized for uh, receiving a prize from the university and for making a deposit into an institutional repository. Institutional recognition can be recorded in three ways. Uh, it can be done manually by an authorized individual, and I'll be showing you that. It can be done semi-automated by uploading a templated spreadsheet. So for example, if you have a large number of people that you want to recognize, you can output a spreadsheet or a file from an, an existing system and upload it into ResCognito. And thirdly, uh, and uh, is by real-time APIs. At this point, we don't have any people doing that, but this is obviously uh, where we'd like to go with the system. So I'm gonna switch back to the, to the demo and um, come to the browser. And um, I'm going to go to our QA system um, because I don't want to put any real data into the system. And I'm going to be searching for someone that uh, some of you may know, Christy uh, Holmes, uh, possibly a colleague of many of you. And I'm going to her ledger. 
And if we look at her ledger, we can see some recognition. Uh, and again, this is just uh, demo information. It's not real, but we can see recognition from other universities uh, and other individuals. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier on is the ability to recognize based on a DOI. So uh, in this example here, we can see that Christie uh, has published this manuscript. Uh, and if I click on the recognize button that's next to this manuscript, next to this DOI, the DOI is passed to the ResCognito engine. And it's smart enough to know all of the authors that were published uh, on this particular uh, manuscript, provided they have an ORCID ID, which comes back again to the theme of this presentation, is that enab what's enabling this is the ability to have an ORCID ID. So in Christie's case, I'm going to recognize her for writing the original draft of this paper and for supervision. And these are the credit taxonomy terms. For those of you who don't know, credit is a standardized taxonomy for manuscript recognition uh, from the CASRAE uh, uh, standards body. Um, I can also recognize some of her colleagues. For example, maybe I want to recognize this individual for data curation and for funding acquisition. And I can go through and recognize multiple individuals for multiple terms. When I click the recognize button, this is going to uh, give me a confirmation screen. And then Christie's page is updated to show these two new acts of recognition. So that's another example of peer recognition, except driven by a particular DOI or particular manuscript. Now I'm going to show you institutional recognition, and I'm going to switch over to a spreadsheet. Um, and this spreadsheet might have been output from another system, or it could be created manually. Um, and you'll see the first column in the spreadsheet is an ORCID ID. And as I move through the spreadsheet, we can see the reasons that I'm going to recognize Christy. So one is for institutional repository deposit. The other is because she won a university prize. I can add more explanation about why she uh, is being recognized. I can put in a link, could be a DOI to the object itself. And then here I'm going to identify the number of COGS or awards that I want to give her. And I want to give her 25 for the prize. And I'm going to save this spreadsheet back into my system. Now I'm going to log into the system as a system administrator who is actually uh, has permission to upload this spreadsheet. So I'm going to navigate to my hypothetical university library, and I'm going to click the ingest button, and I'm going to navigate to upload uh, that spreadsheet that I was just editing. The first step is to test it to make sure that the ORCID IDs are valid and that recognition reasons are valid. And now I'm going to click import, and that's going to import uh, the uh, manuscript, uh, 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 the uh, recognition uh, into her profile. Uh, now I'm going to go back to her uh, profile or her ledger, as we call it. And you'll see that it now includes the two recognitions that I uploaded uh, from uh, the spreadsheet. And this is how a university would collaborate with us, is uploading files in this way. Also, if a university has an agreement with us, they can go into their settings as an individual. And instead of recognizing on behalf of their personal capacity, they can recognize on behalf of the university. So now that I've made this change, I can come back to Christie's ledger. And when I view it again, I'm going to click the recognize button, except now, instead of recognizing in my personal capacity as Richard Wynn, I'm recognizing on behalf of university XYZ. I'm going to choose to give her 60 units of recognition or COGS. And I'm going to recognize her because she shared some negative results. And now, when I update this page, you'll see that her ledger once again has a new entry. Now, one of the things about the ledger is that it's very detailed and has multiple entries. And that's good because we want to capture all the things that people uh, need to be recognized for. But it can make it difficult to read or difficult to understand. So we've added a visualization button so that we can see Christie's um, contributions or recognitions with this ledger. 
So the blue boxes here represent universities or academic institutions or other uh, institutions that have recognized Christie. The width of the arrow, of this blue arrow, indicates the amount of recognition that she's received. In the case of the green boxes, it's individuals, in this case me, and the green arrow uh, 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 indicates the level of recognition uh, by the width. And the, the reasons for recognition are shown here uh, on the left. So this is not on our live site. This is a new feature that we're rolling out uh, probably uh, next week. Uh, similarly, um, we have visualization uh, where individuals are being recognized for a particular manuscript. So in this case, this manuscript, which is a PLOS manuscript, we have two authors with ORCID IDs, and we can see that they've been recognized uh, for the credit taxonomy for uh, a, a variety of reasons shown below. And I can limit this, so if I just click on uh, Yoko, we can just see his or her recognitions, and again, we can see the recognitions for the other author. So this is a very useful way to visualize uh, the recognitions that have been received for a particular manuscript. Okay, now I'm gonna switch back uh, to the PowerPoint so I can wrap up uh, with some use cases uh, and uh, get to your questions. So one of the pieces of feedback we often get is the possibility that people will um, game the recognition system. And of course, that's always possible. But we believe that by being transparent and by doing network analysis, some of the gaming behaviors can be filtered out. So in, in the case of person A and person B, at a superficial level, they've both received 60 units of recognition or COGS. But in the case of person A, the individuals recognizing A were not recognized by anyone else. And so we might discount or weight the value of those COGS and reduce them by 90% and say this person actually only has six units of recognition. In the case of person B, they were recognized by an institution and by other individuals who were recognized by themselves by institutions and individuals, so by credible nodes in the network. And again, we might apply a positive weighting or a multiple weighting to these units and say person B is actually being recognized for 80 COGS. So this kind of network analysis going back through the network and looking at recognition is exactly the same as the way uh, Google uh, does uh, website ranking, or at least the way they used to. They probably have better technologies now. So I'm going to finish up by uh, looking at a number of candidate library projects, and we'll hope uh, some of you would be willing to participate with us in uh, being early adopters or running pilots. Uh, one is assigning credit. Uh, the second one is recognition of IR deposits. And third is the amplification of institutional awards and grants. So in the case of credit, let, I am imagining that one of your faculty members has written a paper and put it onto a preprint server or put it onto, uh, published it in a journal. Once it's received a DOI, that DOI can be added to the end of the ResCognito URL. Once again, this is a great example of leveraging uh, persistent identifiers because simply adding the DOI to the ResCognito URL means that we can generate a web page that shows the authors of that manuscript. Now, just the caveat here, this only works if those authors have ORCID IDs. So any author without an ORCID ID would not show up in this list. But it's a great incentive to have your ORCID ID because then you can be recognized in this case for credit contributions. So many of you have signed up for the DORA uh, initiative and one of the articles of the uh, uh, DORA is that individual authors should be recognized for their specific contributions. So using ResCognito is a fantastic way for you to show your compliance with DORA. It's free and it's easy. So you can do this today. This doesn't require any agreement with us. You can just go ahead uh, and, and work with your authors to do this kind of recognition. This will encourage much greater ORCID adoption because if there are five authors on the manuscript and only two can be recognized because the other three didn't have their ORCIDs associated with the manuscript, 
well, you can imagine it's going to be, they're going to be pretty motivated to add their ORCID IDs the next time. Um, this will increase faculty satisfaction, especially early career researchers who feel that their contributions are being undervalued. And it will be a great way for your institution to signal its expertise to research funders and the greater marketplace and showcase the contributions that your funders have made. Because we're using standards like ORCID and DOI and ROR, this is reportable information. And we can also offer branded and customized versions for people that want to sign up uh, with us in a more formal capacity. Recognition of IR deposit. So what we picture here is that uh, a lot of uh, academic institutions are having difficulty uh, convincing their faculty to deposit files into IRs. So by offering a recognition benefit, if they do that and saying, look, if you deposit in the IR, you're going to be recognized in ResCognito, you're gonna receive a certain number of COGS and this will become a matter of public record that you made this deposit in a structured and contextualized way linked to the organization's ROR. We think that would be a great benefit and a great way to get people to deposit into IRs. Um, it's very convenient for the recipient of the recognition because all of this is constructed into a single uh, record. Um, it requires no membership by the researcher. So they don't need to sign up with our system. If they have an ORCID ID, that's all that's necessary to get this recognition in place. And it's very low cost and simple to implement, uh, hopefully as you saw from my uh, earlier uh, demonstrations. A lot of universities recognize their faculty for mentoring or other activities and put up a poster in the corridor at the library and maybe a page somewhere on the website. Well, why not amplify that and turn that recognition into persistent international visibility by recognizing that individual in ResCognito for that prize with a link to a description about why they received the prize. Once again, this is very convenient for the recipient because it's consolidated into a single place, it brands your, your organization, and it makes the information reportable through the ROR. And, and also interoperable so that in future the query, the system can be queried if you want to make automations based on prize recipients or uh, IR deposits. So we think PIDs, persistent identifiers, ORCID, DOI, ROR, and credit, which is more of a taxonomy, make possible a new vision where uh, researchers and research professionals are recognized uh, for a much wider range of behaviors and contributions uh, that will really drive uh, open uh, the evolution of open research. So thank you for all for your time and I look forward to hearing your questions. Wonderful, thank you, Richard. Um, so yes, everyone, if you do have questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat box, um, or you can also feel free to unmute yourself and, and just pipe up. Um, as of right now, we have, we had one question from earlier, I think when people were uh, uh, logging in to ResCognito, um, there was a question about the possibility that, you know, it are, might there be um, browser issues or differences between browsers. Um, it looks like we had some issues in Firefox, but not in Chrome. So Richard, do you want to speak to that kind of more technical uh, question? Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear someone had difficulty logging in and, and if they could send me the details, we, we'll obviously uh, get on to that. Um, it, it is a challenge dealing with the wide variety of browsers and, and systems, but we, we do test on Firefox. So um, maybe it was a, an earlier version of Firefox, or maybe uh, there was a high level of security setting set on that particular Firefox implementation, but happy, happy to, to deal with that one-on-one uh, -on -one with, uh, with that person. Great, thanks Richard. All right, we've got some more questions coming in. First, um, do you provide institutions with guidelines for how many COGS specific types of recognition are worth? Yes, that's a, that's a, a question I have heard before. Um, uh, we are 
early on in our process. We've only been live uh, for a few months um, and uh, we will provide guidelines, but our, our ideal situation is that universities would collaborate uh, with each other through either a formal or an informal user group uh, to, uh, to sort of work out um, some of those uh, guidelines. Um, we don't necessarily see that as something that we would impose or, or require people to do, but we're happy to facilitate it as, as best we can. Great, and we had another question come in similar to that, which was, can you speak to the art or science behind assigning a particular number of COGS? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it will be more of an evolutionary uh, experience. And, and again, I would just take everyone back to the idea that the system is incredibly transparent uh, and that these assertions are verifiable. And so if at some point in the future we decided that um, or for, for a particular use case, uh, I want to amplify the number of COGS that someone has received for reviewer recognition for my particular use case, which might be trying to find reviewers for uh, a research funder or a journal, then I might apply some kind of multiple or filter to those COGS. Um, so, so I don't think the actual unitary value of the COG in the long run will actually be that important. What will be the much more important is the fact that it was a verified uh, transaction uh, through identifiable parties uh, using persistent identifiers. Okay, great. Um, we have a question asking, is ResCognito an independent organization or associated with a particular publisher? Uh, we, we are a, a, an independent standalone uh, company. There are no uh, publisher um, owners of, uh, of ResCognito. It's a, it's a private company. Okay, great. Um, next question. So during the audience participation exercise, there was a list of things we could recognize that weren't limited to the credit taxonomy. I'm curious where the other items in the list came from. Is there another standard like credit or something else? Uh, that list came from our focus groups that we ran with a number of early adopters and, and people that we sp spoke to. It's not definitive. We actually continue to update it with each new release. And I would invite this audience um, to give us feedback of things that they would like to see added or rephrased. Um, we're, we're very open to extending that list. And of course, it's in the public domain. So if anyone else wants to use it, we're more than happy. But we felt that credit wasn't enough to recognize people you know, for beyond manuscript items. Um, we also see the evolution of some standards for specific um, fields of research. So for example, in chemistry, uh, recognition with respect to crystallography might be a term that we see in the future um, that we show in the context of chemistry activities. Um, whereas that obviously is of irrelevance to economists, say. Um, so, so I think we are going to see some taxonomies emerge over time. Uh, but once again, we're looking for our customers and early adopters to help us uh, evolve that. And certainly it's not a proprietary part of our system. And we're happy to share that with, with anyone else that wants to use it elsewhere. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So we have a question um, about... Uh, institutional ORCID IDs, which I will say that ORCID IDs are only for individuals. Institutions are not eligible to get an ORCID ID. So I think the answer to that is you will need your ROR. So Richard, can you maybe speak a little bit more about the, the ROR identifier? Because that's a relatively new thing, right? Yes. So if you go to ROR.org, you'll, you'll see information about the uh, research organization uh, registry. Um, uh, there are a number of other institutional identifiers uh, out there, such as GRID uh, and Ringgold, both of which are um, excellent in, in different ways. Um, the ROR initiative, I believe, is a, 
uh, combination of uh, Crossref and the California Digital Library and maybe someone else that I'm um, forgetting. Um, but what's attractive about it is that it is a open public domain uh, standard that certainly we're going to adopt for institutional recognition. Wonderful, and I just saw that um, we have Maria Gould on the call, um, just posted uh, in the chat. Uh, she's the project lead for ROAR, so feel free to email um, info at ROAR.org for questions about that. Um, we do have a few more questions. Um, the next one is, how many universities are currently signed up for institutional services? That's an easy answer, zero. <laughs> uh, we're, um, we, you know, we're at a very early stage and uh, we're talking to people. We're looking for early adopters. We're looking for informal and formal uh, relationships and we're looking to learn about how to uh, improve the, uh, the system over time. Wonderful, so Richard, if uh, if somebody at an institution is interested in partnering with you or, or exploring the options further, uh, what should they do for next steps? Yes, just drop me an email. My email address is in on this last slide here. It's richard at rescognito.com. Uh, and or you can just go to the website and fill in the, uh, the form. Wonderful. Um, okay, so where would someone go if they wanted to find out how to automate the process of adding recognition for outputs added to an IR at the point of deposit or IR publication? So maybe if somebody wanted to kind of build this process into their IR. Right, so, so the, the example that I demonstrated, which was uh, a spreadsheet, we're very happy to send that template spreadsheet to anyone that wants to experiment with that. Um, and then they can populate that spreadsheet and we can um, load it into our system on a, on a QA server so that they can see how, how the recognition would appear. And then if they're satisfied with that, we can load it into the, um, into the live platform. Um, as I mentioned before, the API is really more a statement of intention and direction rather than something we have today, although we do use the API to generate those graphics that I showed you. So it's a JSON, essentially a JSON messaging. Um, and it's so something we would work with early adopters to, to define. Um, but the, sp the spreadsheet approach is actually very robust um, and uh, works extremely well. Okay, great. Um, next question. Have you thought about how the creative arts could be recognized? Um, we actually uh, were talking to someone who suggested that Rescognito would, would actually be quite useful for the creative arts because uh, they're overlooked by uh, many of the um, sort of more STEM related systems out there. Um, we would love an early adopter in that area to experiment with taxonomies and outreach. Uh, it would of course require people to have orchids. So um, uh, as long as they have orchids, I, uh, we would definitely uh, look forward to exploring that field with a, with a good partner. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so how would faculty present the results of ResCognito to highlight their contributions? Is there a public profile display to point from researcher websites? Um, so, uh, everyone who has an ORCID ID has a ledger on ResCognito and they can go there today um, in the manner that I showed, which was by adding their ORCID ID to the end of the ResCognito URL, leveraging you know, the, the, the power of PIDs, uh, or they can do a name search and go, and go there. Um, there is a print button uh, on the top of the ledger, which will output a summary file um, that they can either print native or copy and paste in, into another um, document. Um, but our, ho our hope is that people will actually come to the ledger real time. Uh, we also think that the visualizations will uh, maybe communicate more about someone's network um, and what institutions and individuals have recognized them. So people may want to come directly to the visualizations 
rather than just the, uh, the individual ledger entries. I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, are there any other questions out there? I'm not seeing any more in the chat, but these were all very good questions. Um, let's see, here's one. Um, are publishers beginning to collect this kind of credit recognition from submitting authors? We know faculty need to report this in their annual reports. If so, are you able to pull in this kind of data into ResCognito? Yes, ab absolutely. So, so some publishers are. So for example, PLOS is one, one of those publishers. And the example, the screenshot that I gave you early on of the author whose name I'm forgetting, that is actually a live record on our system. Uh, and that is a, uh, uh, pulled from the PLOS recognition. So um, we, we do, uh, uh, we are also pulling uh, credit recognition from the F1000 journals that also collect credit information. Um, uh, and we're also talking to publishers about using our system directly to collect the credit information. One of, the, one of the challenges for publishers is they're under a lot of pressure to publish faster and to publish at lower cost. And so whenever you ask them to introduce some new data collection activity, that obviously is a kind of mixed message because you're saying, I want the manuscript faster and at lower cost, but I also want you to do this extra admin. So what ResCognito does is it allows publishers to collect the credit information uh, as soon as they have a DOI in parallel to their traditional process. So the example I showed you on one of the slides was a bioarchive um, uh, preprint where uh, bioarchives themselves have collected no credit information, but because you can just put the DOI into ResCognito, you can start collecting the credit information. So I think to, to sort of come back to the, the excellent question, I think it's going to be a combination. In some cases, publishers will collect the credit themselves and will harvest it, uh, or they will just use our system to collect the credit information. Wonderful. Um, and there's a comment in the chat uh, saying it, it looks it, it's, uh, it looks like there are a number of journals that that may be asking authors to identify their contributions with credit terms. So something to be aware of. Right. Um, another question, what is the standards development, what does the standards development look like for interoperability around this kind of credit data? Um, there's the taxonomy, but what about serialization of the data to pass it around? <coughs> yes, I, I think that there are a number of open questions um, that are probably better addressed by standards bodies than, than, than us. Um, but I think uh, what would be particularly useful would be to have a kind of persistent identifier for the credit terms um, so that even when people use slightly different terms, you can still map them effectively. So, you know, one of the funny things about the credit terms is a couple of them have a hyphen in them uh, uh, where it says writing hyphen original draft, I think. And different people use different hyphens. And so if you're doing analysis across <laughs> organizations, you, it, it will break unless you sort of correct for the, uh, the, the different hyphen that people are using or capitalization. So th these are all things that would be better addressed by a standards body than uh, you know, some, someone like us, although we'd, you know, we obviously would be happy to have input into that. Nice. Um, and would Altmetric or Plum Analytics be able to incorporate this info? Uh, I, I, I don't see uh, why not. We have not talked to any of the Altmetrics organizations as yet, um, but we would be more than happy to. Wonderful. Um, are there any other questions? I'm seeing a comment in the chat. The CD2H project created an OWL implementation of credit, and there's a link there. So for those who are interested um, to explore that. Any other questions from participants? And of course, if you do think of any questions later on, you can always email Richard um, directly, richard at rescognito.com. 
have any questions or anything about ORCID, you can email me and I'll put our email addresses in the chat. Seeing any more questions? It looks like we may be. Oh, here's one. Is Rescognito just pulling publicly available articles from ORCID profiles? Yes. Perfect. Any last minute questions? Go ahead and get them in there. Otherwise, it looks like we are getting ready to wrap up. Um, so, thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. Um, I hope you are inspired um, by this and uh, go and tell your friends and colleagues as well. Um, I will be sending out an email with a link to the recording uh, once that is processed, so stay tuned for that. Um, and if there are no further questions, I think we are good to conclude for the day. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks again, Richard. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.